Financially speaking, most Christians today do not understand that they are living their financial lives backwards, spending their disposable income to enjoy life while the economy is good, while saving, starving, and scrimping to survive during recessions and depressions, just as most everyone else does. But consider the life of Joseph. Joseph saved every grain he could during the seven years of plenty, only to enjoy life as he enriched both himself and all of Egypt by selling grain for gold during the seven years of famine, meaning that Joseph was a contrarian when compared with most Christians today. Unknowingly, Vanderbilt and Rockefeller followed the life of Joseph as they were both notorious penny pinchers during the country's economic booms while being equally notorious for spending large sums of money as they enjoyed life during the country's recessions and depressions, through which they had each created two of the greatest personal fortunes in the history of all mankind. I hope that you enjoy this video as much as I do, but before we begin, please hit the like button and also subscribe to my channel in order to hear teachings that you will not find anywhere else. Even better, please share this video with others in order to help spread the word that the kingdom of God is at hand. Thank you for watching. Steve Jobs said, People think focus means saying yes to the thing you've got to focus on, but that's not what it means at all. It means saying no to the hundred of other good ideas that there are. You have to pick carefully. I'm actually as proud of the things we haven't done as the things I have done. Innovation is saying no to thousands of things. What are you saying no to? Are you perpetually broke while saying no to such things as drugs, alcohol, and or tobacco? Are you saying no to television so you can better use that time to develop a musical or athletic talent? I ask those questions because it's all those things that you've needlessly said yes to that have created the inefficiencies in your life and in turn has forced you to live a fruitless and powerless life. Having said that, Luke 19.11 reads, And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable, because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Notice, they believed that the kingdom of God should immediately appear, being the antithesis of life's little by little accumulations. No one advanced that literally every single blessing that God gives will come to you little by little in accordance with your willingness and obedience to accumulate in it. Or in other words, through your willingness and obedience to say no to all of your other inefficiencies that drain away your ability to accumulate. And in turn revealing that one of the most important yet equally unappreciated biblical concepts is that of creating for ourselves new wineskins that will not leak as a result of our inefficiencies. Or, as Matthew 9.17 reads, Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. In this analogy, know that wineskins represent human souls, while the wine represents those spiritual blessings that are meant to be poured into us. Along with that, the word burst does not mean a balloon-like burst, but rather to spring a leak as all dried out wineskins were prone to leaks that obviously caused its contents to flow out and be wasted. Meaning this passage implies we must become born again in order that our new wineskins, souls, will be able to contain the accumulation of our newfound spiritual blessings. And all we have to do in order to create our new wineskins that will not leak is to repent of our former ways and simply do not repeat them. Or perhaps better worded, we simply say no to those things we have previously said yes to. For instance, knowledge comes to us little by little through study. While time spent watching television, gaming, or whatever else creates the inefficiencies that prevent us from being able to accumulate in intellectual power. Musical and athletic talents come to us little by little through practice. While time spent watching television, gaming, or whatever else creates the inefficiencies that prevent us from being able to accumulate in either musical or athletic power. Wealth comes to us little by little through savings and investments. 
while drugs, alcohol, gambling, and or tobacco create the inefficiencies that prevent us from being able to accumulate in financial power, meaning that what we call disposable income, our forefathers called savings. In fact, even Exodus 23, verses 29 through 30, tell us that the children of Israel received their promised land little by little through war. Or as Jesus said in Luke 16, 10, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Meaning those who seal the leaks of their lives will be faithful to accumulate little by little into eventually being faithful with much good. Conversely, those who indulge themselves in the unjust leaks of their lives will eventually be unjust with much evil, such as lung cancer, multiple DUIs, and or a drunk driving fatality, perpetual debt, and so on down the line. Which in turn leads me to say that much of our faulty perception as to why we encounter unanswered prayers rests in our inability to seal the leaks of our life in order to allow the blessings of God to eventually accumulate into our answered prayers meaning that many Christians waste their time praying for a financial miracle because in the mind of God, he had long ago given their financial miracle to them, only they failed to hold on to it through its little by little accumulations. As more often than not, our wasteful leaks revolve around our desire to be entertained, being those things we lack the self-discipline to say no to. Which now leads us to the prosperity gospel's most commonly quoted verse. Matthew 6:33 But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. As prosperity preachers love to use this verse in order to prove that God will add things to us when we seek first the kingdom of God through such things as tithes and offerings, church attendance, Bible studies, so on and so forth, which is a deceptive misinterpretation of scripture because contrary to our human perceptions This verse isn't with regard to having things added to us, but rather it's about our efforts of self-sacrifice by saying no to things per its preceding verses. As verses 31 through 33 read, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. First, know that the kingdom of God in these verses is not literally our eternal resting place of heaven, as is so commonly believed, but rather it's figurative for the secret desire of our hearts, or any other promise that we desire to receive from the Lord, meaning that we must seek first our kingdom of God promises through our self-sacrifice of saying no to those non-related things that would slow us down in our race to receive them. Or in other words, we must say no to those leaks in our lives that would prevent us from being able to accumulate in the necessary aspects of grace by which to eventually become our promises. Then, After we finally figure out how to become our promises, those things which we had previously sacrificed will eventually be added to us. Subsequently, our errant notion of seeking first the kingdom of God through such things as tithes and offerings, church attendance, Bible studies, so on and so forth, are actually how we seek to grow in our knowledge of his righteousness, thus revealing that we seek first our kingdom of God as we grow in the power of God's greatness, while we seek his righteousness as we grow in the power of God's goodness, the combination of which will eventually empower us to grow in the spiritual balance that will eventually protect us from self-destruction. Anyway, once you create for yourself the new wineskin that has sealed your former leagues of inefficiencies, then know in advance that you cannot return back to your old ways, because bad things happen whenever you do. Or as Acts 7.39 reads, To whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turn back again into Egypt. Once you return back to your former slave-to-sin ways of Egypt, then you unknowingly allow your wineskin to spring leaks and let those things which you've accumulated into slip away. And in turn, the Lord will place your feet upon your former wilderness circles, whereby you'll eventually find yourself once again going nowhere. Or, as Matthew 12, 
43 through 45 reads, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out, and when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. You see, when you repent of your former ways and seal your wineskin from further leaks, then you've kicked an evil spirit out. Conversely, when you decide to return back to Egypt, you spring leaks by allowing that evil spirit to return seven times worse than before, meaning that bad things happen whenever you return back into Egypt. Or as Hebrew 10.38 reads, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Which now leads us to Malachi 3.10, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Know that we've long misinterpreted this verse. As from our point of view, we believe that something is given to us once we take physical possession of it, which has caused us to infer that God will give us a blessing that will initially be so great that we cannot receive it all. This being a preconceived and unrealistic expectation on our part. In reality, from God's point of view, this verse tells us that it's the ending of our blessing that will be so great that our imaginations could not initially receive it all, even if it were told to us. Mindful of that, the Lord opened the windows of heaven and poured out a seed blessing idea to perfect the light bulb into the life of Thomas Edison that was so great that Thomas Edison simply could not initially receive it all as there was no way that Thomas Edison's imagination would ever believe the ending growth potential that his seed idea contained that would accumulate little by little into one of the world's largest conglomerates called General Electric. In like manner, the Lord opened the windows of heaven and poured out a seed blessing idea for the telephone into the life of Alexander Graham Bell that was so great that Alexander Graham Bell simply could not initially receive it all, as there's no way that Bell's imagination would ever believe the ending growth potential that his seed idea contained that would accumulate little by little into that gigantic AT&T, being even exponentially larger, those other baby bells that were formed after the antitrust split were also added into the equation. All of which leads me to our final examples of Cornelius Vanderbilt and John D. Rockefeller, simply because they seem to best exemplify the biblical concept of wineskins, as they had chosen to live as contrarians to most of us today. You see, both of them began dirt poor and uneducated, yet despite those obstacles, both had grown to become two of the most famous and wealthiest Americans who ever lived. And it's simply because they both lived self-disciplined lives of leak-free wineskins. In fact, it was said of Vanderbilt that his life was regulated by self-imposed rules, claimed one admirer in 1865, and with a fixedness of purpose as invariable as the sun in its circuit. Among other things, he determined to spend less every week than he earned. While Rockefeller had said of himself, I trained myself in the school of self-control and self-denial, meaning that despite their lack of formal education, they were both wise enough to become masters of self-discipline in order to consistently say no to those inefficiencies of life that virtually everyone else says yes to. As they did not squander their money on those things that entertain, but rather allowed their money to accumulate in order that they and their families could eventually become autonomous. Through which they embodied Proverbs 13.22, A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. As it was Vanderbilt's self-imposed rules and Rockefeller's self-control and self-denial that sealed their wineskins from any economic leaks of inefficiencies, and in turn empowered both of them to accumulate in great wealth for both themselves and their grandchildren. Rockefeller was especially interesting, as he grew up even poorer than Vanderbilt was, and his father was basically a horse thief and a con man who kept living home for long periods of time. Therefore, from a young age, Rockefeller had to learn how to care for his mother and siblings, and was forced to grow up rather quickly without much of a childhood. And because he had to become the man of the house at such a young age, he developed the habit of carrying around with him a small notebook, in which he itemized every penny he spent in order that he could track and understand where their meager finances were spent. 
meaning that he wasn't a miser per se, but rather so poor that he was forced to make sure that they never squandered what little they had. Unbeknownst to many, Rockefeller was a staunch Christian who strongly believed in tithing. Even though they basically couldn't afford to tithe, he did so anyway. As Rockefeller's notebook had become a type of seal to his wineskin, one that empowered him to allow his extremely small beginnings to accumulate little by little into a massive fortune, and in essence, becoming the world's first billionaire. Now I mentioned that Vanderbilt and Rockefeller lived as contrarians to most of us today, in that they saved every penny they could during the country's times of economic expansion, then spent all they could during the country's recessions and depressions in order to buy competitors who were in trouble and or bankrupt, as well as to purchase property and expand their businesses during those recessions that drove down the costs of good and labor. Conversely, most businessmen today only have the courage to borrow and spend money when the economy is booming, only to turn around and starve, scrimp, and save during recessions and depressions. Meaning that Vanderbilt and Rockefeller got it right, while the vast majority of others got it wrong. You see, saving every penny you can while the economy is booming is to create a new wineskin that's empowered to accumulate, while the vast majority of others have failed to seal the leaks that in turn make them vulnerable during recessions and depressions. Does any of that sound familiar? Such as the economic pattern laid down for us by Joseph? After all, Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dreams that the land would experience seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine, through which Joseph saved every grain he possibly could during the seven years of plenty in order to see them through the seven years of famine. Meaning that while the rest of the world struggled to survive during the famine, Egypt acquired great wealth during the famine by selling for gold their grain held in storage. Likewise, though I'm sure that neither Vanderbilt nor Rockefeller thought of Joseph when they did this, but both of them had also saved every penny they could during the country's economic expansions in order to have plenty of cash on hand to spend all that they could during the country's recessions and depressions when their competitors were strapped for cash and or bankrupt, as well as to buy the property, expand their businesses, while the cost of goods and labors during those economic lulls were cheaper. Granted, many despise them for this, seeing them as types of vultures who simply pick the bones of the dead and dying, when in reality this strategy was to their glory for having shown the necessary self-discipline to live wisely within the confines of how wealth is created through the little by little accumulations of life. After all, since both of them had to overcome their dirt poor and uneducated beginnings, every single person in American society back then had the exact same opportunity to do as they had done with the primary difference being that Vanderbilt and Rockefeller had each trained themselves to say no to those things that the rest of society says yes to. Which highlights the fact that, for whatever reason, society views financial power differently than either intellectual power or musical and athletic power. After all, everyone in society has the exact same opportunity to grow in intellectual power, but not everyone is willing to discipline his or herself to study. However, those who refuse to study don't despise the intelligent who did. Everyone in society has the exact same opportunity to grow in either musical or athletic power, but not everyone is willing to discipline his or herself to practice. However, those who refuse to practice don't despise the talented who did. But, for whatever reason, many who refuse to live the self-disciplined lives required to accumulate in financial wealth through savings and investments definitely despise those who do. See, unbeknownst to most, all of life exists as a never-ending series of barter trades. As the wise, such as Vanderbilt and Rockefeller, had, unlike most, chosen to say no to the comforts of their present in order to accumulate, little by little, into their future states of autonomy, after which all they had previously sacrificed to then be added back to them. Doesn't that sound a lot like Matthew 6, 31-33? Therefore, in closing, know that it will take an incredible amount of courage and self-confidence in order to seal your wineskin with the self-discipline to say no to all those things that most everyone else says yes to. Or, as Henry Wadsworth Longfellow had said, we judge ourselves by what we feel capable of doing, while others judge us by what we have already done.